Hey everyone, welcome back to Amplify. I'm your host, Sam Ashu. Today's episode is a special one devoted to the topic of racism in medicine. Our country is grappling with racism and our individual parts in it. And we in the medical community are no strangers to racism. In fact, racism has some strong historical roots in the practice of medicine. And so today, I've invited Dr. Maury Selby to join us to begin that conversation about racism and the part it plays in medicine today. Dr. Selby is a practicing emergency physician and host to Health in Harlem, a radio show that's been on the air for now over 14 years. And so I'm sure you'll enjoy hearing him speak about this topic as much as I enjoyed discussing it with him. Without any further ado, here's Dr. Selby. Hi, my name is Maurice Selby, Maurice Donovan Selby. And I threw the middle name in there for all my friends out there, colleagues that uh, always looked at that middle initial and so it to be a mystery. Well, <laughs> it's, it's uh, out there now. Maurice Donovan Selby. I am an assistant professor um, at the Emory University School of Medicine in the Department of Emergency Medicine. And actually just recently moved to Atlanta, Georgia from New York City. Lived in every borough of New York City, um, including Staten Island. Went to public school all the way through um, up until uh, SUNY Downstate College of Medicine, actually and then did my residency there um, in Kings County Hospital in emergency medicine. And also I'm the host of uh, Health in Harlem, uh, which airs on WHCR 90.3 FM every Thursday. And uh, we actually recently developed a podcast to accompany our broadcast show um, in recent with, with the recent developments uh, with COVID-19 as we can't pr- um, produce it in a studio now. So. Awesome. So in addition to listening to this podcast, you can search your Apple podcast app for health in Harlem uh, and start listening there as well. Thanks so much for agreeing to be with us today. I invited uh, Maurice to join us specifically to talk about racism in medicine. As the country's been struggling with identifying racism, I've had more conversations with partners, uh, friends in medicine, uh, people I went to residency with, other people I've gone to medical school with about racism in general, but also specifically in medicine. And there has been uh, a surprising lack of knowledge about the history of racism in medicine and almost a a denial of the existence of racism in medicine currently. Mm-hmm. You know, some people operate with the idea or the notion that, well, there may have been some in the past, but we're not implicitly racist in our medical practice, therefore it must not exist. And when I speak to my partners or friends of color, whether they're physicians or even as patients, that's not the the response or the experience that they're getting. Uh, And it's distinctly different from what the others are saying. And so today, my hope is to kind of shed some light on what the history of racism in medicine was, but also what it looks like today and what we can do to identify it and start to hopefully change that, uh, especially that perspective that you know some some people might have that it doesn't even exist anymore. Mm. I think you're on the money in that um it, you know there's this sort of uh, belief that or amongst some um, and some unfortunately is a, you know a significant proportion of uh, the medical community that this is, is doesn't exist or at least doesn't exist in the historical sense uh, when we talk about racism uh, in medicine and really that historical sense you know has its roots in things like niggerology, which for centuries right uh, we're talking about starting in the the 16th 17th centuries at the height of the transatlantic uh, slave trade, where essentially um, there was this sort of scientific inquiry to establish the inferiority of black people. And therefore, through that inferiority, um, you know, sort of rationalizing and legitimizing the destruction and exploitation of, of black bodies, um, you know, that's, that's where this history lies. Um, this sort of overt <laughs> racist um, scientific quote unquote pursuit, um, which we now acknowledge as pseudoscience today, 
but some of the the beliefs and misconceptions from that time persist um, today, and they've made their way uh, from you know these individuals that wanted to perpetuate um, this hugely lucrative business. Um, it was made their way its way from there through the medical establishment. Um, and we're talking by way of our reputed journals, right? Um, in the history of medicine, uh, some of the biggest names in medicine, uh, such as James Marion Sims, the father of American gynecology, um, and his beliefs that blacks had higher pain thresholds and therefore he can experiment on his slaves and perfect his gynecological procedures. Um, that's where this history comes from. And while we don't see it everywhere around us, um, you know, you can't just experiment like thanks God for things like the IRBs, um, local IRBs and sort of um, the ethics behind uh, medical research that we have established today. Um, you know, thank God for that stuff. But some of the subtle uh, beliefs and misconceptions and even subconscious uh, biases that we have, those things persist. And that is the problem is that we can't see it on the surface is something that we really have to dig deep to acknowledge. And it's really something that we have to acknowledge in each and every one of ourselves. When we talk about the history of racism in the past, we're talking about things like the beliefs that uh, Black people would not feel or perceive pain in the same manner mm -hmm. that Black people uh, could somehow endure uh, excessive amounts of uh, heat, work extra hours, yes. uh, not have to eat or drink as much, really anything that would support the practice of slavery as an excuse to continue to enslave black people in and justify that medically. So somehow yep. that their physiology is different and therefore this is an acceptable practice. Correct. That is correct. And that as as time has gone on and some things in the practice of medicine have changed like you mentioned the IRB for example mm -hmm. uh, that's the institutional review board that is supposed to review the experimentation you're going to perform on a human being in the name of science and then approve it as being humane and acceptable that's those right. kinds of institutions were developed to try and combat that specifically and make sure that you you don't have some kind of racist, unethical, inhumane treatment of human beings in your experimentation. That's right. But, but yet, despite that, we still have these pervasive viewpoints, right? So for example, you and I were speaking before the start of the recording about non-compliance in patients. That's correct. Uh, and and the perception that black people might be non-compliant with medications or recommendations of their physician uh, mm -hmm. because they're just not interested in taking care of their health or yes. it's not a priority for them. Yes. And that's part of that history or at least what had what the remnants of that history. Right. Um, these sort of beliefs um, and and prejudices that we might harbor as clinicians, I'm saying, right, as we treat patients at the bedside um, and rather than maybe digging deeper to see, right, what the real motivation behind this, quote unquote, noncompliance um, might be rather than, um, you know, coming to the bedside, sort of um, uh, assuming that the patient might not only understand you right and be educated enough to engage you in a, a discussion about the care that they're receiving and where they want to go with that care and the direction of that care. Um, we have maybe certain beliefs that we might um, sort of dismiss a patient's concerns right off the bat. We've already written them off as being um, a difficult patient, quote unquote, um, or a patient that might not be worthy of um, going through that more detailed investigation um, and and really giving them the optimal care. And it's something that, like I said, is, is not um, that the motivation of the clinician is the problem. I think the vast majority of clinicians out there, right, we strive to do our very best for our patients. Um, but at the same time, um, our Achilles heel is going to be these uh, biases and beliefs 
that um, it's not our fault. We've been trained to think this way uh, mm. sometimes. And it's not even just uh, through the history of medicine, but in terms of what, what messages we receive from all around us in society, um, that constant messaging that informs everything that we do in medicine, from uh, public health measures to, down to uh, medical education and the doctor-patient relationship. We still see that kind of racially based practice of medicine even today. You know, two quick examples that come to mind are things even as simple as blood pressure management. You know, mm -hmm. you look up guidelines for management of hypertension and it is right there uh, in writing, you know, what is the color of the patient's skin? Mm -hmm. And then you should pick this agent. You know, if they're white or, uh, you know, some other race, you should pick this agent. And if they're black, you should pick this as a starting agent, which seems odd. I mean, it sets the precedence for there being a, a racially Racial based difference. difference. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that's still, that, that's still pervasive today, even in medicine, but it kind of seems to almost legitimize the practice and say, Hey, you know, there are differences and those differences can be based on something that we attribute to skin color. And therefore you should change your practice based on that. Yes. And that's, it's strange, right? At least to me, it seems strange given our history uh, and how far we've come that we still look at research like that and go, yeah, okay, you know, there's a, there is some, somebody did a study and it turns out that based on your color of your skin, this is what we have. And we run with it and, and believe it. And I think that really just points to sort of um, the pervasiveness of this problem in that it starts at the highest levels and has really worked its way down to, like you said, in the delivery of care at the bedside. Um, and really what it comes down to is, is addressing at every level, um, you know, as we said, uh, starting at the societal level and talking about uh, changing legislation. Um, so for instance, for instance, the implementation of institutional review boards, right? Starting at the highest levels, um, but also going down to the individual level and questioning guidelines like that um, or questioning our uh, rationale as we deliver care at the bedside. Are we making decisions um, based on this individual patient or from what we uh, believe based on what we've been told by society or based on what we um, misconceptions that we might hold at heart? Um, and really, when we look at, you know, examples of how this might play out. Um, so, for instance, um, in cases with children and they come in with injuries, um, you know, of different sorts. And I have a four year old, so I know like <laughs> these kids are going to fall. They're going to do things, mm -hmm. um, get into trouble and, you know, come up with boo boos and they come to the ER. And when we have and I've experienced this um, even in my training where kids came in and, you know, the, the parents were able to give pretty good history and um, things aligned in terms of the injury patterns and sort of uh, what was relayed by the family. And yet we still asked that question was, oh, well, is this a, um, you know, should we call um, uh, ACS? Should we call, you know, uh, adult child services and get them involved in this case or social work? Um, when Pretty much every indicator from the history and physical indicated that this was, you know, an accidental uh, trauma. And we would see in the same shift um, patients uh, from different backgrounds, um, white patients, Asians, and that question really wouldn't come up. Um, and it would be very similar circumstances. Right. Um, and so getting to at the sort of at the root, like what motivated what was that motivation behind thinking that this might be a non-accidental trauma. And again, I think it goes to show that, yes, we all have that child's right um, best interests in mind. I think when that decision was made, or at least to think about calling adult child services, um, we had that child's best interest in mind. But at the same time, when we look at what could happen, right, the fallout that could result from calling adult, adult child services, the stress on that parent, um, the investigations that might take place and um, sort of uh, um, ceasing of benefits, um, public, you know, public aid benefits and stuff that might come with that, um, housing 
uh, jeopardy of housing for these people, like all of these things that can sort of uh, happen just because we had this implicit bias that no one really acknowledged. And that's what it, it probably stemmed from. And even now with the pandemic and COVID-19, we're finally starting to see some public reporting and collection of race data. Yes. And and it for me it seems to be heading in that same general trend. You know, we look at the mortality rates of people who are black versus people who are from other races and mm-hmm. we see the mortality rates are higher. Yes. And then we see unceasing uh, opinions published uh, about why that is without any good real data. Things yes. like, well, black people have more hypertension and diabetes, or black people are more likely to be non-compliant, or yes. black people live in poorer neighborhoods and have less access to medical care and therefore have a higher rate of other diseases, and therefore that must be the cause for this discrepancy that we're seeing. Yes. And, and while we can say that, and I, I think those things are, are very true, right? There's um, tons of data sort of backing that up. Um, those are facts, if you will. Um, however, what is not acknowledged um, routinely, and this, this I think goes back to the beginning of our, of our conversation, where you said that there are people that just didn't even acknowledge racism in medicine. Mm-hmm. Um, and the where the racism in medicine really comes in is at the the provider level right these are societal ills that yes led to the disparities um, that we see with hypertension and diabetes in black and urban communities um, there are uh, issues right stemming from historical racism um, from things like the tuskegee syphilis study or really going even further back than that right um, as far as um, Black people and the, some degrees of mistrust of the medical profession. Um, but when we talk about the individual provider, there are um, some of these outcomes can't be just explained by those sort of societal um, level issues. But we talk about individual practice at the bedside. And so, for instance, the fact that uh, women in New York City, for instance, black women are 12 times more likely to suffer um, uh, death in maternity, right. Then white patients, um, in the city. And when we look at sort of the experiences of black women and, and what they tell you, even my wife, um, as she, we're currently expecting now and some of the concerns she has, it actually happened with us where our sort of biases. And I'm saying that me, even as her husband, um, we didn't address her concerns at times, sometimes we said, oh, you know, uh, your, your water didn't break. You just, um, you know, you, you just might be peeing on yourself and sort of dismissing those concerns. And we were on our way to discharge when actually my daughter was about to be born. <laughs> wow. And, uh, um, you know, I, I remember being um, next to her and, you know, she's very frustrated at that time and, and wanted to be reexamined to really determine whether or not, you know, her um, membranes have, had ruptured and me coming off an overnight shift and really <laughs> was really wanting to go back home and get in the bed. I was like, yeah, you know, they're, they're probably right. I mean, these are difficult exams to conduct. These are difficult things. You know, I think, I think we can, we can go. And, um, you know, at first she was sort of being, um, discounted as far as her concerns. Um, and, Ultimately, when we checked again, we actually did rupture and, and my daughter was going to be born. Now, who knows what might have happened, right? We'd gone home, her membranes are ruptured, and we come back later when we're at a higher risk for, um, you know, things, um, infectious etiologies and prolonged rupture of membranes and stuff. We could have had much more difficulty and a worse outcome um, if we had just let it be the way it was on that initial assessment. And that's something that um, while we can't, uh, as I said before, I don't think this is something that we consciously do where we say, you know, I'm just going to write this person off. But in terms of the uh, implicit biases as far as educational level of our patients, 
their ability to understand um, our assessments and instructions and even uh, when patients advocate for themselves, right? Not being labeled a difficult patient, but a concerned patient that requires mm -hmm. further counsel and maybe they deserve, you know, they want that reassessment. Maybe we, they have legitimate concerns for wanting that reassessment. Um, that's where these issues really come into play. Um, and, and, and these are things that are very hard to account for um, at the individual level, because as we said, it's not something that's conscious. You are not consciously doing these things. You are not, you don't consciously want your patient to have a bad outcome, but at the same time, some of the misconceptions um, that we have, and they stem from, as we said, this sordid history um, that we're all involved in and um, affected by, that's where all of this comes from. And it, and it really um, uh, serves to account for some of the discrepancies that we see in, in terms of health disparities and, and outcomes um, between blacks and white, and, and white patients. And when we think about in that setting, trying to combat something that's not even on my mind uh, overtly to, mm -hmm. to try and change, that seems almost like an impossible task. But, but you know, I think the first step is just recognition that, that this is existing in this relationship between me and the patient. Yes. Uh, you know, at least acknowledging, okay, there's going to be these interactions where I'm just going to want to be dismissive of this patient, or I'm going to attribute something that I haven't actually investigated. I'm just going to say, oh, they're non-compliant. They're yes. you know, chronically non-compliant and just dismiss it. So acknowledging the problem is step one. Uh, but then, you know, it, for you and I standing there at the bedside with our patient, where where do we go from there? Once I go, oh well, okay, this is a this is a non compliant patient. Now what? You know that that's that's the next challenge there, right? What what do you think? That is the next challenge. Um, once we've established sort of, um, okay, this is what you know I'm presented in front of me, and now I need to um, uncover right what what is in my thoughts as the provider? What am I thinking about this patient? How do I feel? Um, about this patient, what I've been told, and how am I going to acknowledge um, uh, biases that I might have toward this individual? And how am I going to overcome those biases? That's really what it, what it comes down to. And I think, as you said, um, one, acknowledging, right, that racism exists in medicine, um, not in the form that we saw it, um, you know, decades and centuries ago, um, but in a more subtle and implicit uh, fashion that is persistent and more difficult to deal with. But then at the individual level, um, dealing with the fact that we all have these biases, we all have them. Um, in all of our interactions with patients, we come to the bedside with some amount of prejudice and bias that as clinicians, we must acknowledge and uh, deal with in order to provide optimal care. Um, and, and it's, it's something that is difficult, definitely requires more effort. Um, and that effort, right. Translates into digging deeper when a patient is being difficult, there might be a reason why that patient is expressing themselves in a certain way. Maybe it, it might not be that interaction with you. It might be an interaction with, um, another provider recently, why they're not following your instructions or why they do not want to follow through with um, a diagnostic plan or a treatment plan, um, and really digging deeper to uncover that, that's, that's the only way um, in which we can really um, deliver the best care possible. It's, it's so fascinating to me that, that this is still something that we have to combat on a daily level uh, or on a daily basis. I recall last year looking through the fourth universal definition of myocardial infarction, something I'm sure you read on a daily basis. Yes. <laughs> it's, a, uh, it's a compendium uh, that the, uh, the cardiologists put out annually, maybe less than annually, and it's just going through the different MI, so STEMI, non-STEMI, mm -hmm. type 1, type 2, et cetera. And there was, at the very end of the article, just maybe like two or three lines that said, in patients with non-STEMI, there was a trend 
for higher mortality in patients of color, so black patients and patients mm -hmm. of non-white races, that even when you accounted for uh, all of their medical history, all of the care that they received, still could not be attributed to just their medical risk factors, suggesting mm -hmm. that there was a bias based on the color of their skin. And this yeah. was like a little two sentence blurb at the end of this massive document. And it was actually the most striking part of the entire article as I read and said, wait, you just said that patients are going to do worse when they have a non ST elevation MI purely because they're black. Black. Yep. And for and no other, no other risk factor, no other attributable cause. Nothing else can account for it. Yeah, it's just the color of their skin, suggesting that there's bias still in medicine, and you buried it like at the very last two lines of this article. It's crazy, and, and it's crazy. And the thing is, it can um, why I think why it's so difficult to account for that, right? Why there's quote unquote no explanation is because we can't be in the heads of the providers um, uh, of those studies, right? Those patients, those um, uh, people in that sample. Um, or wherever that, that data was obtained and they, you know, made that statement, we can't be in the heads of the, that, those providers at the bedside, right? How um, urgent did they think those patients needed to be seen? Were they pulled from the waiting room because they had chest pain or were they sort of written off as malingering? Mm -hmm. um, were they that, were, was this a patient that had social issues, right? Um, stemming from societal race, racism, right? Um, which uh, we know the economic disparities um, that are attributed to systemic racism in this country. And so, um, this person comes in and, you know, they're sort of disheveled and maybe even undomiciled. And that person, um, doesn't come back right away because they have chest pain and everybody thinks they just want to be, want to, want to be in the emergency department for, um, a, a bed and something to eat. Right. Maybe that was the thinking of, and I'm not just talking about physicians, but the triage nurse. It could be the clerk, the registrar that's checking that patient in. This is at every level in the system. Um, everybody is implicated in this, including myself. That's the, you know, as a, a, a black man that treats black patients, I operate with the same um, uh, biases at times. And I have to step back and say, hey, you know what? I need to go a little bit deeper. Um, a perfect example of this. Um, and, and there was a, a woman that came in, an elderly female. Um, this is at um, my old places um, at Kings County. Elderly female comes in and, you know, she's very upset. And at one point we're thinking maybe she's exhibiting some sort of uh, delirium and symptoms of psychosis because she's saying that, you know, she's been speaking to God and her landlord has been infesting her apartment apartment with bugs and trying to get her out of the apartment, right? And so he's he's deliberately infesting her apartment apartment with bugs. He's like coming in and out of the apartment um, when she doesn't want this person there, and it's all um, uh, the, all of these actions are directed at her, um, and she's been praying to God, speaking to God to deal with this issue. And at first we're like, you know, this is. Um, you know, a patient, maybe she's just been, has a psych history. We really didn't have much history on her. Um, and so we're looking in the records to see if she had any previous psychiatric, um, you know, visits and in, in the psych ED, we're, uh, going back to the bedside and just trying to obtain more information. And lo and behold, we get our social workers involved. And finally we, what well, we uncover and it, she's, she had been there for a long time. Um, and after we, after we excluded, you know, any sort of, uh, medical etiology, um, for this, what we determined was that everything she was telling us was actually true. <laughs> and really? this is true. And, and, and what it was is that, um, right. We know this in New York city, the reality of gentrification and, uh, landlords that are intentionally slumlords trying to evict patients from, from their apartments. And this was not a woman that needed a psychiatric evaluation. Right. Um, this was a woman that needed a social worker at her side to help her keep her apartment. Mm. This was actually happening. So he wasn't deliberately infesting the apartment. He just refused to call in um, exterminators. He purposely, uh, you know, um, 
let the building essentially rot to get people out of their apartments. And she was praying to God <laughs> to to remain in her apartment. Um, and this was a woman, you know, she was of, of West Indian descent. And so um, there was some uh, cultural issues. I'm African American. I was born here, uh, raised here. My family, you know, has roots down south. And so some of the things that she was telling us, you know, we told it to some of our other colleagues. They're like, oh, yeah, of course. Like they were able to, um, and them being of West Indian descent, understand where she's coming from, how she's talking, mm-hmm. how she's um, describing her interactions and talking, quote unquote, to God. She's praying and she was trying to to really um, seek aid and, and remain in her apartment. That's what really everything sort of um, came out to be. But again, we had to dig deeper, right? We had to put aside our um, biases and really get to the heart of the issue for this patient. And I mean, it took extra effort, but in the end, I think we were able to optimally serve her um, because we didn't commit her to um, an inpatient psychiatric facility. You know, Mm -hmm. we were able to get her the services that she needed to remain in her apartment or at least get her on that track. You know, one of the one of the most striking cultural differences that I unfortunately see on a regular basis in my practice is in just the notification of death to a family. Mm. You know, when I see I've had to have that conversation with families multiple times and I hear from my partners and from other staff in the emergency department, you know, we'll suddenly hear an uproar of yelling and wailing and uh, just an outpour of grief and emotion. And people will just stop in the emergency department and look up and go, what's, what's going on? You know, what, mm-hmm. what, what is it? What is all that noise all of a sudden? And, uh, and, and, and then someone will say, Oh, you know, a patient just died and they're notifying the family. And you can see just a mixture of facial, expressions. You know, you've Mm -hmm. got the people who are sympathetic. You've got the people who are kind of rolling their eyes and go, oh, you know, here they go again. They're yelling and screaming and tearing up the waiting room or, Mm -hmm. uh, or they're being loud and boisterous and disturbing, uh, with, with, with a complete kind of passing over of the fact that, you know, they're, the cultural differences we have, even just amongst Americans. Now, I'm not talking about people from other countries. Uh, kind of lead us to to take that information in and to express it differently. You know, when I when I'm sitting with a family who says nothing and just you can see tears pouring down their eyes and they're they're grieving, but they're not outwardly demonstrating anything else. Mm -hmm. And then the next person I tell is thrashing about and yelling and moaning and wailing. And I've, I've had those discussions with people. They go, Oh, that's just, you know, another black family reacting that way. It's so uh, disturbing to the rest of the department, or it's Mm -hmm. so annoying to hear that, or, you know, it's, uh, it's going to scare other patients. Uh, And, and there's a, a lack of, and of, of understanding, well, you know, you, you put yourself in their shoes. We just had to tell them that their mother passed away or yes. their mother died. And, uh, and yeah, there is a cultural difference in how we express that emotion. You know, yes. some, some cultures will come out and be more outwardly vocal about it. And that's okay. They weren't harming anybody. They were Correct. just, you know, a, causing a perceived disruption, but, but the, uh, the reaction was different, you know, yes. it was, oh, they sat there, they were tearful, they're crying, I can tell they're in pain, you know, what can we do? Should we bring them back? Can they see exactly. their loved one? As opposed to the other scenario where it was like, wow, this is just, you're being disturbing to patients, you're yelling, you're screaming, you, you just need to go away. Yeah. And, and that, that difference in, uh, in even just the, the cultural response to that moment of grief, uh, is so tied to to race as well that they're but the response is completely different depending on on who it is the, it is and um this i think this also sort of goes back to what we were saying as far as um when we look at these outcomes and we try to account for these things Right. Um, the the poor outcomes amongst African-Americans and really people from the Ast- African diaspora in general um, and other marginalized people. When we 
look at our reactions to them, right? And we wonder why <laughs> people are non-compliant or people don't trust our recommendations when they're skeptical of things, um, even with, so, for instance, COVID-19, right? And, and sort of the mistrust of the medical community and what's happening around us. We can't, to a certain extent, we can't fault those people because of our reactions uh, to them. And, and part of those reactions, like you said, are um, rooted in our biases. Like, oh yeah, man, the, the, you know, black families, I'll tell you um, uh, just in terms of my practice in, um, in Kings County and being in central Brooklyn and just the myriad people from different backgrounds um, in the West Indies and how, they grieve, right? And everybody is different. Even within uh, these collections of, of islands in the Caribbean, um, how they manifest grief and despair is very, very different, right? And we talk about from Haitians to um, Dominicans, right? Even being on the same island, um, they manifest their grief in very different ways. Uh, some outwardly, some more uh, inwardly, and we, as providers, are cognizant of that. And when you hear the, the wailing in the, in the hallway, you kind of know who's, who's out there, right? But at the same time, um, acknowledging our, oh boy, like you said, we roll our eyes like, oh man, that noise again. But at the same time, we have to um, really, at that point, make that effort, like you said, to say, well, you know, as much as it's uh, loud and might be unpleasant for everybody around. We have to go and provide care for that people. We're not going to just shoot them out of the emergency department, but I'm going to talk to them um, just as I would any patient that has lost a family member about the next steps, right? Um, about having having them um, uh, setting up uh, memorial services and how they can contact our um, admissions department to sort of finalize those proceedings and get them to, to the mortician to be memorialized and be there to support them, right? Uh, from, a, um, from a standpoint of their, their grief and providing things like tissues and stuff like that is what really we should be doing for everybody. And when we don't do it, this is where that comes from, that mistrust and um, non-compliance, quote unquote, and really just not being, um, being a fan of Western medicine that's where all of this comes from. And so that, that uh, adversarial relationship between um, doctors and the patients that they're treating that are underrepresented and, and marginalized. Now, let's shift gears for one second. We've been talking about racism in the doctor-patient relationship from mm -hmm. the standpoint of the patient, but it exists from the standpoint of the provider as well. So the physician, the nurse practitioner, the PA, I've spoken to people in those positions who have personally experienced racism as a medical provider, which was even more surprising for some of my colleagues who mm. think, well, if it, you know, if they believe it doesn't exist between the doctor patient relationship, they certainly don't think it's going to exist in amongst the providers, but they have, a couple of them anyway, have confided in me in uh, regarding some of their own experiences with racism as a medical provider. And I'm always surprised by it. It always takes me kind of by surprise when I hear about it, because it's not something I personally experience. But I'm curious to hear if, if you've had those experiences, and if you have any hesitance about telling people about them. Mm. Um. I can say that I've had those experiences throughout my entire career. And I'm talking about going back as a, a high school student mm. all the way to now. So, um, you know, I remember walking into the guidance count counselor's office um, as a student and sort of uh, as, a, as a high school student, walking into the guidance count counselor's office and just seeking information on right college, the admissions process and really getting ready to, to start my applications. And the first thing that, that uh, she hands to me is just the local sort of community colleges. Um, you know, at that time, I was an honor student involved in multiple sports, managing ed editor of the newspaper and um, had my eyes set on a range of possibilities as far as um, college op options. But she relegated me to 
you know, uh, what she thought was appropriate for me as a black male. Haven't even, you know, she hadn't even gone into my file to see what I had been doing up to that point in my um, high school career. Um, we in college actually. So as when I was initially getting my um, advisement during orientation, um, my guidance counselor, who ultimately, you know, was ultimately one of my um, pre-medical counselors when I had inquired about just some information about the, you know, pre-medical courses and sort of getting um, on track to apply to, for medical school, or at least what the, what it entailed and, and in terms of getting ready, um, she refused to talk to me until I had done two semesters, right? To sort of, I guess, prove myself, refused to give any advice um, in that regard. And I talked to some of my other co colleagues, right? Uh, white Asian um, who had received that advisement at the same time um, mm. during their initial enrollment into the college. And so um, it's something that that still happens um, today. And in terms of, you know, the microaggressions um, that persist even up to this point in my career, whether it is a patient that mistakes me for a nurse or a um, patient care technician um, are also subtle, right? And people don't know that they're doing these things, but these are microaggressions that can um, be detrimental in their constant um, bombardment of a person's psyche. Um, we have literature showing how detrimental that can be to providers. And it, it's those nagging things, those little things that um, little insults or assaults, I would say, that um, can ultimately make you question yourself as a provider, right? Um, leading to things such as that imposter syndrome, which we um, know can affect all of us, but has um, perhaps even more effects on minorities and there's literature um, sort of speaking to that as well. And so it's something that, that I've definitely experienced and I know some of my colleagues that have experienced it as well. And have you, have you had any hesitancy in talking about it or even, you know, reporting some of these things, or is there even, I guess I would say, is there even a point in that, but, but even just to kind of start the conversation about how it affects you personally, is there a, uh, any kind of backlash or any encouragement to keep quiet about it? Have you ever experienced any of that? So it's one, and I, I, I think it's something that, um, just as your colleague said that they really didn't talk about it with anyone unless the person asks questions about it, right? Yeah. And what I think that stems from is kind of what we've been talking about in that nobody wants to be a racist or no one wants to sort of even be aligned with any characteristics or attributes that one would associate with racism, right? So if I were to, to, to call someone out for, um, you know, looking at me and Maybe I got there at normally, right? I get to my shifts like 6.50. <laughs> I'm, I'm always like that. I'm a stickler for punctuality and just being on time. So if I get there at 7.01 and somebody's like, oh, you're, you're late. And I've seen other colleagues that come in, um, white, Asian, you know, of other backgrounds and no one says anything. Hmm. And the one time, right, and usually it's like a legitimate reason why I was late and somebody acknowledges that. I'm like, well, was that like an assault on me, like hmm. as a black man and this sort of stereotype of I don't know if you ever heard of um, CP time, color people time. No. no. Oh, boy. Anyway, that's a whole. <laughs> but it's a, it's a stereotype that's associated with um, uh, with black people sort of hmm. never being on time. And so and so me that you know that's sort of a microaggression um and whether the person meant it or not um sometimes it's done um jokingly right these are assaults or verbal assaults that we don't even know that we're doing these things sometimes when we do them um and it's it's not just it happens to black people but it happens to everyone right the studious asian um medical student right and there and and people sort of um uh thinking that they don't have any other interests outside of medicine or, you know, some of the misconceptions that come with uh, being of, of Asian descent and some of the things that people might say, um, even with, with women, um, sort of the comments that are made to, and actually there was a, 
um, an article I was reading where a surgery attending, you know, sort of discouraged a female student from going into surgery saying that, you know, you can't, you won't have a family life if you do this, you know, you won't be able to be there for your kids. And, you know, this person that was interested in surgery now has to go on with that in her mind, right? Not just focusing on being an excellent surgeon or training to be an excellent surgeon, but now she has to sort of in her head grapple with the idea or the prospect that she might not be able to raise a family, right? And that person had that made that comment had no <laughs> no idea what this young lady was capable of. Mm. Um, the, these are the things. That, and maybe that attending didn't mean anything by that. If anything, they thought that they were, um, you know, advising this person in a supportive way by giving this, them this information or making that statement. Um, but at the same time, this is an implicit bias that was in this person thinking that, oh, was that the go even the goal of this young lady? Who knows? Maybe she didn't even want to start a family, right? But this was the assumption of that attending to say something like that. Um, and, and, then, and then this young lady has to go on and, and sort of work through that, you know? Yeah, and I've heard about these uh, experiences of fellow emergency physicians in which seem like subtle ways, but actually things that I've, again, I, that I haven't personally experienced, uh, for example, working in the same practice alongside a partner and having the black physician get questioned about their care of a patient more often than the white physician for the mm. same exact care in the same exact scenario. And it seems hypothetical, but I've actually spoken to some of my own partners and and heard them complain, oh gosh, you know, I had another conversation with so-and-so and it didn't go well. And I go, oh, that's strange. Why did it not go well? I've never actually had them really get into it with me. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, maybe is it, is it, you know, was it a hostile conversation? Was it uh, something in the way that they said something or, or what was going on? And they say, well, you know, they're just, they were questioning my care. And, and so again, my, my initial inclination was, oh, okay, you know, you're probably just taking this the wrong way. They mm -hmm. questioned your care. It's okay. They're just trying to get more information. Maybe they're trying to assess what's going on. And he said, no, no, you don't understand. It wasn't just, you know, did you get a CBC? Did you get a CT scan? It was, hey, why did you order this test? This was completely useless. Mm -hmm. And that has no bearing on why they're there in the emergency department. And you should know better. And then I just kind of stopped and went, wait, they actually said that <laughs> that came out of their mouth. And, and he said, yeah, that, that came out in the conversation, but this is like the 10th time he says this to me. And I say, I don't, I don't understand like that. That's never in, in the realm of my entire experience been, been my conversation with this physician. And, mm. and I've been working beside you. I would trust you treating my family. I have no mm -hmm. idea why their response was this way to you. It's not like your care is so far outside of any kind of standard. Uh, and, and then, you know, as I started to ask more about it, more and more and more uh, occurrences started to come out. And I said, I, I, it's, it's almost, it's mind boggling to not even know that this is out there and occurring. And, and my, the physician I was speaking to was reticent to report it or to say anything about it because, you know, his viewpoint was this was associated with race and he wasn't going to start a big racism battle with this other physician. He was just gonna take it and say, this is what it's like for me to practice here. And I just gotta have thicker skin and put on my shield and armor before I go to work every day. And in order to preserve relationships, like this is why, and that's exactly why it's so difficult, right? You don't wanna call your colleague a racist. There are um, uh, individuals that I've practiced with um, that have said things and uh, done things where, you know, they, they, that, w that I wanted to address, but in terms of pervert preserving our working relationship and even friendship, um, I would really, in terms of how I thought they would take it. Right. Um, and, and telling them that they had these, that I think they were operating with certain biases and maybe needed to think about that more. Essentially, um, it could be taken as, Oh, you're calling me a rate. And I've seen it even with patients where, you know, um, and I said similar experiences where, you know, I counsel a patient on the diagnostic and treatises and, you know, that could sort of um, hamper or complicate our interactions going further. Uh, and in plan after having seen them and 
and, you know, gathered a, a good HMP and, you know, present the plan with them. We're going forward and they have questions about certain aspects of the workup. You know, I, I do my best in explaining why we're doing certain things or the utility in doing certain things, risks, benefits. And they're not quite on board, but then it has to be legitimized by my colleagues, right? Whether it's another um, a consultant <laughs> mm -hmm. or even um, validated by the nurse, right? And then they understand, like after they get that second opinion, and it's, it's usually um, uh, a white person, that um, then the patient is on board and they, they're totally with the plan. And I put it in, it probably went in even more detailed in explaining why these things need to happen, but I, they, they had to have that second opinion to legitimize my workups, mm -hmm. you know? And, and um, it's, again, uh, do I confront the patient about that? You can't do that, <laughs> you know? Um, but these are the implicit biases that we have. I mean, one thing, you know, there's times where I walk to the bedside and if I'm not confused for a nurse or a um, uh, PCT, uh, sometimes once, I, once it's established that I'm the doc taking care of them, they say, oh, so where'd you go to medical school, right? And I'd never see, you know, they don't ask my colleagues that or con consultants that come on after me that uh, are taking care of them, but they ask me that question. And so I have to sort of legitimize myself, right? I have to tell them, oh, I went to the SUNY Downstate College of Medicine. Yes, it's a, you know, accredi accredi accredited <laughs> medical school here in the United States. And yes, I did my training at, you know, SUNY Downstate in Kings County, a, a very reputable um, program. Yeah, I'm highly qualified to take care of you now yeah. and, and we can move on. But these, these are things that happen. And these are these microaggressions that, um, you know, I think, uh, like you said, your colleague and I, to a certain extent, I, I think myself, we put on this armor and just sort of are able to work and deliver care. And I would say quality care um, regardless. But these things do weigh on you. Right. And, and it's another thing that we don't really... Um, understand the effects, but over time, right, these are stressors. So things that you have to think about, um, which impact um, everything, even the, the clinician themselves, and in terms of burnout and, and uh, progressing in one's career. It is interesting for me that we spend time discussing these things, or maybe there's just more awareness of this when it comes to gender than when it comes to race. Because I've heard these same things from uh, colleague emergency physicians who are women saying, yes. you know, they get mistaken for nurses or technicians, right. or they'll walk in and introduce themselves as physicians. And then later will still be thought of as the nurse and the patient will say, well, I never actually saw the doctor. That's right. Yeah. And so the, the female physicians, even some I've spoken to who said that they make a point of wearing their white coat and their badge just to stress the importance of, no, I'm actually the physician taking care of you. And yet they still get those same kinds of questions. Where did you go to medical school? Where'd you do your training? How long have you been here? You know, are you working mm -hmm. with someone today? <laughs> you know, kind of like, are you a student? <laughs> um, so so I'm surprised again to hear that that there is a, a racial predominance to those kinds of questions as well. That's right. Yeah. And um, even in terms of, you know, we when we look at that, um, these sort of microaggressions and, you know, things like the the minority tax and when we look at the proportion of uh, faculty, right, uh, from underrepresented backgrounds uh, in medicine, all of these things impact that, right? And so right now we only have about, what, 7 uh, to 8% of the faculty, right, in, in all of the uh, medical college throughout the United States, uh, seven, only 7 to 8% of the faculty are uh, from underrepresented minority backgrounds. And when we try to think about increasing those numbers, um, one thing that's often not taken into account is dealing with these, um, these issues each and every day, right? Mm -hmm. And how they weigh on individuals that are trying to aspire to these um, various careers in academic medicine. Um, all of these things, and really even at the bedside in terms of delivering care and being able to practice right, with longevity into the future, like all of these things weigh in and, and can affect clinicians um, each and every day as, as we strive to take care of patients. And so it's, it's something that is um, pervasive 
But again, I think what it really comes down to is, is really looking at ourselves as individuals. And I'm talking about practitioners, especially, but, um, uh, even when it comes to society as a whole, each and every individual acknowledging these beliefs that we have, that we operate with each and every day. Um, that's really what it's going to come down to in terms of, um, addressing racism in our society, but especially in medicine, especially as professionals, right. That want to do better. That's the thing. Mm -hmm. Not everybody in society wants to change. Not everybody in society, um, uh, you know, wants to address racism and, and remove it from our society. Um, but I think the, the majority, I would really want to say that every practitioner, nurses, physicians, um, patient care technicians, EMS personnel, um, everybody wants to deliver the best care to patients. And with that said, I think all of us want to deal with racism, but it really has to start with ourselves. And if we acknowledge that one, that this exists and that we are all implicated in it, then we can actually move on to begin to, to actually tackle the problem, beginning with ourselves. Well, that's said about as well as anyone could say it. I think the, uh, the, the starting point is, is acknowledging it, which hopefully we take a step towards today with this podcast. Uh, and then from there, there are certainly lots of resources, information people can start to read uh, and and digest about the existence of racism in medicine, and then just taking it and trying to apply it in daily practice is a chore. Uh, it's not easy. It's, a, it's definitely something that is going to take more effort, and it's not going to come uh, naturally to a lot of us, but but certainly, uh, at least having that discussion with your partners. You know, if you're out there listening to this podcast and you uh, are a person of color or you work with people of color, I encourage you to have that discussion and not shy away from it, and just inquire about some of the experiences of your partners or share your own experiences. Uh, and and hopefully, you'll find a receptive audience uh, willing to make that change. Uh, so Dr. Selby, I want to say thank you for taking the time My pleasure. to be with My us. Pleasure. I really, really appreciate you uh, taking the time out of your busy schedule. Uh, Health in Harlem in the app store for whatever device you've got. Uh, go search for the podcast or listen to it uh, on the radio. And uh, hopefully this won't be the last time we talk and we'll be able to nab some more time out of your busy schedule in the future. 